Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> I, uh, I will continue speaking unless anybody tells me that you cannot hear me. I, uh, I hope that you can. I want to welcome you to this, uh, this evening's session on Russian politics uh, in the Danish Foreign Policy Society. As more and more participants are dropping in, I know we have a a very high number of people joining us today for this uh, very timely uh, session for this uh, for this meeting in a, at a time where Russian politics is really uh, at another uh, maybe critical juncture. Uh, Vera will tell us a lot more about that in a minute. My name uh, is Lukas Lausen. I'm the uh, I'm the chairman of the Danish Foreign Policy Society's uh, branch for members under 35 years old. Um, I am uh, I have with me today uh, Vera Kishanova, who is a former municipal councillor in uh, Moscow, now residing in the United Kingdom, who will be our guest tonight. Uh, with me is also Nigi Nada, who is also a member of the board of uh, the Foreign Policy Society U35 branch. Um, and we will be uh, we will be with you throughout uh, this session that we pro uh, that we foresee will last about fifty to fifty five minutes this evening. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Danish Foreign Policy Society uh, has been uh, founded in Denmark just after World War II. We have uh, we are committed to uh, broadening the debate on uh, foreign affairs, uh, foreign politics, and international relations in Denmark. Uh, but also working internationally with partners and allies around the globe. Um, we believe, uh, as, we, uh, as we've coined that a few times, that foreign politics and international affairs are too important to be left alone just for politicians. Therefore, we take those debates and make them uh, available uh, to everybody. Uh, and uh, that's why we include everybody in the discussions about foreign politics. Um, Today's guest is uh, my own uh, friend who I've known since studying in the United Kingdom uh, a while ago, uh, Vera Kishanova. Vera has uh, been elected municipal councillor in Moscow many years ago, I think by now. Uh, Vera can tell us much more about that later. I'll ask you some questions about that. Um, and uh, and as you uh, probably are all aware, we will uh, we will also dive deeply into the matter of Alexei Navalny, who is uh, right now on his third week of hung hunger strike, as I understand. And we are doing this event on a day where there is a massive protest in Russia, some of the biggest that I'm aware of, uh, protests announced in 100 cities tonight. Uh, I have just now seen that uh, Unsurprisingly, members of uh, the circles around Alexei Navalny have been imprisoned. Uh, central squares in major Russian cities are now being closed down by uh, by the by officials, um, and lots of other stuff is uh, is going on. I will uh, we will kick this off by asking Vera uh, a bit about her own expertise and her own experiences from Russian politics, and we will. Uh, go out into the world and look a bit more about, uh, look a bit more at Russia uh, in the world and then dive back into uh, Russian politics and uh, into the case of Alexei Navalny as well. But let me start now by uh, welcoming you, Vera. Good evening. Good evening, Lucas. Thank you for inviting me here. Fantastic. I'm, I'm so happy you, uh, you could make it and you could join us today. Vera, uh, you have been in Russian politics yourself. Uh, you are and have not been in Russia in Putin's ruling party. You have been uh, standing on your own or in an uh, in a in a in an entirely different political movement. Could you tell us start by telling us a little bit about um, why you entered politics in Moscow um, and what uh, what kind of experiences you took away from that? Well, uh, thank you for, for the question. Uh, first of all, I should say that the situation now and the situation eight years ago when I was elected is uh, two, different, uh, two, different, uh, two different situations. So a lot of things that were possible back in 2012 uh, when I became a counselor in Moscow 
uh, wouldn't be possible today. And vice versa, by the way, it's it's uh, it's not so straightforward, but a lot of things that uh, the civil society has learned to do in Russia that we didn't know uh, back then uh, we were able to. So the government is in inventing uh, more and more uh, creating more and more barriers, uh, but the civil society is finding more and more and more creative way to overcome them. But I'll come back to this later. Uh, so speaking about myself, um, I, as you mentioned, I started uh, my first, uh, my background is in journalism. I started working as a journalist since I was 14, uh, pretty early and, uh, well, but I've always been writing and thinking and uh, concerned about uh, local matters, about cities, about urban policies. So my first experience in journalism it was in the local newspaper in the age of 14. And uh, in 2011, 2012, it was a very special time uh, for the Russian pol independent politics. And I think I may, I may, I may say that uh, both Navalny, myself and many other uh, people you see now in Russian politics, they they were metaphorically born in 2011, 2012 during the protests, uh, born as politicians. So uh, it was uh, it was a very special time. It was uh, ahead of the parliament elections in mm -hmm. in Russia. There was the when uh, Vladimir Putin announced that uh, surprise he was going to come back. Uh, and ran for the third time uh, to become a president. And all of it after uh, four years uh, of the relatively uh, softer policies uh, under Dmitry Medvedev, who of course never had been uh, seen as an independent figure, as mm. always seen as uh, Putin's puppet, um, so to say, but, but still it was different, even the, the rhetorical difference uh, made some difference. So that announcement created a very, um, uh, a lot of a lot of dissatisfaction. It uh, triggered protests. There were the, the largest, uh, we, we saw the largest rallies uh, since the breakup of the Soviet Union on the streets of Moscow, St. Petersburg and other major cities and uh, the the demands were pretty generic. Pretty, uh, like it was. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't a movement of a specific. It, it wasn't run by a specific party, a specific uh, political um, organization. It was a broader umbrella movement. What were the demands back then? Hmm? What were your demands back then when you when well, you the entered the street back in uh, back now ten years ago? Pretty straightforward. It was uh, fair elections uh, because it was triggered by the uh, rigged elections in the parliament. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why it was so massive was because uh, people uh, like Navalny, including himself, uh, had um, ahead of the elections, they had been very actively promoting the idea of participating in uh, observing elections as independent uh, members of the civil society. So a lot of people were carrying uh, posters and the rallies. I saw this with my own eyes. My vote was stolen or uh, I, like, I saw somebody vote stolen. Uh, that was, so that was something that made politics uh, suddenly made it personal for people who had never had experience in, in it. And um, so that for a while we thought that it opened up a window of opportunity and that we had, we sent some, uh, some liberalization, if I may say so. Mm. And that's how uh, people like myself with uh, no or very little experience in politics, with no big parties, big money with uh, behind us, uh, managed to get elected uh, to different levels of the local uh, local power. Was your was your political agenda just fair elections and, and, and democracy or, or, or any other specifics? Uh, you mean my or the movement in general? Well, 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 well yours, actually. 
Well, I, I ran as an independent candidate, but as you know, I'm a member of the Libertarian Party and mm -hmm. I was the first elected Libertarian, not as a party member because the party is not registered like most opposition parties in Russia, but it's, I, 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 I may say it's the second biggest after Navalny, uh, second biggest mm -hmm. opposition movement in Russia now after Navalny's own uh, platform. Uh, so yes, my, my own agenda was to uh, minimize the government intervention on a local level that and uh, maximize uh, people's involvement, people's opportunity to influence the decisions. In my case, on the local level, how the tax money is spent, uh, who makes a decision. Okay. Uh, so, but again, on the local level, it's it's a very non-ideological uh, position. Mm. So, as as you can imagine, it's. And in, in any, we, 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 we've seen a lot of it in, in Oxford where we together, where we studied together, we've seen, we've yeah. had people in local politics and, and surprisingly the issues are very similar in different mm. countries. I mean, uh, that doesn't, uh, just to me, even in the Danish context, that, that platform or that, those, those, those policy asks don't seem outrageous or very uh, radical to at least at least at least from my from my perspective and and I guess a lot of other people in Denmark wouldn't seem that as very radical or very uh, very critical uh, as, as well but I guess in Russia in the Russian context it it was and I also uh, if if I recall you 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 didn't you didn't come into the parliament or the, the Moscow government with without any uh, without any trial of repercussions from the uh, from the ruling party right what do you mean by repercussion? Uh, so there, I mean, was it was it easy and was it without any uh, uh, pushback from the ruling party that you could just uh, stand for an election as an independent candidate and and make those demands? As I said, it was a very very special time. So back then, mm. uh, the whole uh, all this. Uh, political machine all the power of the system that was was focused on uh on keeping putin in power because it was the, the, on the same day there were two level elections the presidential elections and those local elections on the local level in moscow so uh they were for, uh they were election rigging they've been documented uh but uh most of them were on the uh, on the presidential level, so we managed to sneak in uh, by, uh, yes, using this, uh, like opportunistically using the situation. And uh, another thing is that back then, very few people knew and cared about local politics. And that's what I think mm. maybe was my, that's what I consider probably my uh, most important impact in, in this discourse, because there were very few of us who ran and uh i remember come going from from door to door ringing people's doorbells mm. and uh telling them i'm your candidate i'm your neighbor i'm living i'm living the, the next street the same the same mm. street would you vote for me and they had no idea that there are they were asking but wait wait are you running against Putin? Are you, do you want to be president? <laughs> I said, no, we have a council. Ah, okay, then can you please uh, raise, uh, raise my salary, relaunch the space program and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so, okay. and that was, that educational activity that we were doing uh, by explaining people the structure of the local government and the level that they can actually influence even in the Russian situation uh, it's it's very I, I think it was very important, but fast so then, forward, Lucas. Yeah. Uh, fast forward few few years later, it wasn't it was already a different situation. So in 2014, I ran for a higher position, and I was attacked uh, together with my volunteers. We were collecting signatures uh, in support of my candidacy, and we were physically attacked uh, by by whom? Uh, mm? Well, it was. It was a person who uh, later we found out uh, him to be uh, uh, a, like a secure, he was a security guy uh, working mm. in a nearby uh, shopping mall, but he clearly had an instruction from somebody 
uh, saying because they didn't harass other candidates who were yeah. uh, we we were not we were collecting signatures on public territory that was so I was the only one attacked and we of course went we, we went to the police uh, we provided them with the data de uh, with personal data of the person who attacked us but yeah they destroyed our booth they destroyed our uh, tore apart our uh, signatures and the same things was happening all over Moscow with other same things were happening with other independent mm. candidates and that was the year of the annexation of the Crimea of the invasion to Ukraine so that was uh, there was a different situation when it was much harder mm. to be an opposition uh, candidate a politician and we're talking about today I open right now well we, we can go back to this later. Yeah. Um, then one last question about your own experiences. Um, do you feel that uh, as a member of, uh, for example, the municipal council in Moscow, that you had any uh, influence on the policies uh, actually uh, shaping the city of Moscow? Or, uh, or, or was that something that if you were deviating from the official uh, United Russia or, or leading party line, then uh, then you wouldn't be able to, to influence politics in reality. Uh, if we're talking about my own experience, uh, yeah. then surprisingly, yes, yeah, surprisingly, we had some influence, uh, again, because there was a coalition of independent mm. uh, councillors from all over Moscow, and we were able to exchange our experiences to uh, somehow formulate a common agenda to push the reform on the city level towards more decentralization, more fiscal independence of the uh, local governments. And why I can, uh, how do I know that it was, uh, that it, it made a change because when there was uh, the mayoral election uh, mm. in Moscow a year after we were elected, uh, and all the candidates have to uh, get the signatures from municipal councillors like myself. And that was the election when Navalny ran against the Moscow's uh, incumbent and current mm. uh, mayor, who's uh, Putin's party member. And all the candidates, all the six candidates, including Navalny and including the United Russia Putin's party member, they had uh, a very large part of their program dedicated to expanding the um, uh, expanding the powers of these local councils. And as I told you in 2012, nobody knew what the local council was. Mm. So, and later 2019, they were no, it was 2000. Well. The, and after that, uh, five years after I was elected and other few of us, there were already hundreds of independent candidates uh, who ran and uh, much more. And I think several hundreds who were elected in different parts of Moscow. So politics, surprisingly, politics takes a very uh, unexpected forms in a, in a situation where it's bent from, from the top level uh, political process, uh, it, you find out that you can do something on a lower level and it helps people to fight this, what they, the psychologists call learned helplessness and to, to realize hmm. you can make a change. Well, okay, good. Uh, I would like uh, now just for a couple of questions to zoom out uh, a little bit uh, because we, uh, apart from the news coming out of Russia today on the internal domestic issues, uh, in uh, on this day, um, the last couple of weeks has also also been filled with Russia's external affairs, specifically surrounding uh, Ukraine. And uh, Ukraine is a country that you know very well there as well. You've been living there as well. Um, the uh, the movements right now on the border to uh, on the border to uh, to the Ukraine and uh, have been criticized by the by the West uh, a lot. The the uh, the new U.S. president has been very vocal about this as well. Whether or not the West will will step in here at some point is is something that I think is a bit far removed from this discussion. But the, it, it begs the question that I have been asking myself again and again. Um, and maybe that is a very obvious question to somebody that knows Russia a lot, but is there 
in Russia, or at least in, in, in Putin's party and surrounding Vladimir Putin, uh, an idea uh, that you can, that Russia has an, a legitimate right to rule over what was once the Soviet Union and is still some kind of Russian uh, fear of interest. Well, there is a very uh, well-known uh, quote for, coming from Vladimir Putin. Uh, he once said that the breakup of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical uh, catastro catastrophe of uh, the 20th century, the greatest or the greatest tragedy, something like this. Mm. And uh, this is this should tell you something. So mm. yes, uh, as like, as sad as it is, uh, there is quite a strong sentiment. Uh, and it's not it's not necessarily uh, uh, in favor of restoring the Soviet Union as a communist regime. It's more like an, this uh, sense of an empire. So yes, yeah. there is. Uh, we cannot get into Putin's head, of course. We don't know uh, what are his plans, what he has in store this year. And mm -hmm. there is that sad joke that uh, we don't need political analysts anymore in Russia. We only need psychiatrists to uh, figure out what's what's happening, with, what's going to happen with the country because Putin has created a system in which it's basically one man's. Uh, everything mm -hmm. is, all the decisions are made within one person's head, and that person is mad, as you as you may know, if, especially if you've seen Navalny's uh, brilliant, brilliant investigation about his uh, secret empire and his palace and his, uh, his path to power, which I, by the way, recommend everyone to watch if you haven't already. It has English subtitles and it's a great uh, uh, excursion into Putin's uh, mm. origins of power, starting if from... We work as a KGB officer in Dresden. Mm? That's good. Um, sorry, no, if we if we then look at that, well, he obviously has an interest in destabilizing Ukraine and and might want to push push into the country itself. Um, then do you think if if something like that would happen, even if it might be somewhat successful, whether he would stop there or is there uh, is there would there be other countries um, that are independent now uh, that he would have an interest in uh, maybe pursuing as well. Uh, there has been again and again talk about the Baltic countries. Uh, now they are a different ball game. They are a member of the European Union uh, and, 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 and therefore might be even more protected in a way. Um, but do you think that, that, that um, a venture into some other country uh, is, is, is possible at some point? I don't think he will openly uh, move that forward. He will openly attack mm. the countries that belong to the European Union or the NATO. Uh, we, we're, I don't know if you're following the news from the Czech Republic uh, now. Yes. Yes. So, but again, that was, that's more of an, uh, th that's more like, looks more like Putin's kind of, uh, Putin's style, mm. Putin's style of, uh, doing things uh hybrid warfare yes an undercover uh warfare hybrid warfare so something mm. like this uh something like this i'm afraid yes is possible mm. but the and question is of course he's not he's not a, a re he's not a reasonable person in that sense so you it makes little sense to uh calculate well what is he trying to do by doing this and because uh, he's doing a lot of things out of spite. Mm. Uh, he's a product of a, he's a product of a, of a culture that uh, mm. that only uh, understands brute force. Uh, but then, again, the situation is different. It's not 2014 when mm. uh, the annexation of the Crimea, which nobody expected, uh, helped him to uh, gain some patriotic scores and uh, his rate of support uh, fueled by propaganda soared uh, exuberantly. And, mm. uh, but then what followed, we all know, it was the, the economic crisis, uh, yes. the fall of the, the, the sanctions uh, and the counter sanctions that hurt Russia even more than the European sanctions against it. Mm. Uh, so Putin, in that sense, it was a, a a classic example of shooting on your own 
And, and 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 picking up on that, uh, picking up on that, uh, that is shooting yourself in the foot because he is uh, he, he's threatening the, his own people's uh, e economic success, of course, but also because uh, some some key oligarchs surrounding him have been have been more and more um, uh, well 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 the the. Uh, Sanctions have have been targeted to them, and therefore their their life their life and livelihood has also been impacted. Is are there are there a lot of of people around Putin that are that are turning against him, and is that effectful? Um, no, not around him. There are people turning against him, but they immediately <laughs> leave the circle, uh, mm. the close circle, and even the not so close circle. So Putin is okay. uh, back again. Like, if we say 10 years ago, they were during Medvedev's time and during those protests, which I mentioned in the beginning, there was this notion of two uh, conflicting uh, the Kremlin towers, as we used to call them, like two Kremlin mm. towers fighting each other, the, the more liberal, the more dovish one and the more hawkish conservative one. And mm. uh, there were some politicians uh, mainly in the economic bloc, like the Minister of Economy, the Minister mm. of Finance, uh, that were uh, connected in the public opinion to this. Uh, they were seen as more liberal and dovish, but mm. gradually, and, and what happened in 2012, uh, it, it, it's, uh, well, in Putin's head, it, it looked like the, the betrayal on behalf of this liberal wing. It, okay. it was like, uh, not just the liberal wing in the Kremlin, but uh, but the the middle class that uh, was able to emerge under his uh, under his rule in his first two terms. So mm. and, and his and what followed next, uh, if we look at it from Putin's perspective, it was like this. Okay, I I did everything. Like, I gave you uh, a chance to proliferate. I gave you a stable economy. Yeah. Uh, you were I and everything I asked from you was to just let me uh, and my friends uh, get what what is ours, and we won't touch you and you don't ask like I won't ask questions we won't ask questions you won't ask questions, and then uh, those protests were seen as a betrayal, like we had a pact and uh, you broke it okay then no more liberalism no more uh, no yeah. more debate and so now. In, in his inner circle, there are more, most people are either as a uh, hawkish, conservative, uh, traditionalist, uh, aggressive as he is, or even more mm. because everyone tries to uh, impress him uh, by being more uh, aggressive than the other. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, if we then look at the the society uh in in russia more in general and and uh and the political arena um peter pomerantsev wrote a very interesting book uh, a few years back called uh nothing is true and everything is possible if i recall that right uh where he kind of outlines how intricate the system of fake fake news basically and fake uh opposition and fake media uh, is and how that all is controlled by in the end Putin uh, or, or, or the people, uh, the people surrounding him. Um, and and even when I talk to uh, to Russians in the West, they say that their families back there um, are, are often very very unaware of what is actually going on in the country because uh, media are so skewed into one direction. Um, is how how big of a problem is this total control? Of of the public sphere uh, for, um, for, for gaining any momentum for democracy in that country? That's a great question. See, uh, the Russian population is 150, uh, 140 million. Mm. Uh, Navalny's video about Putin's palace, palace was watched by 115 million, which means basically every grown up uh, Russian citizen has watched it which is a huge uh, coverage. So it means that, yes, of course, Putin 
has done a lot of work destroying the independent. Tel first, he started from television. The first thing he did in 2001 when he came to power was shutting down an, uh, a critical TV channel. Uh, then he came for the paper media. But back when I started journalism 10 years ago, there was still a lot of online uh, sources uh, where you could do actual journalism, not propaganda. Uh, but then with Navalny and people like Navalny, uh, they know how to take to talk to the so-called smartphone generation and P Putin doesn't. He's a president of a TV screen. So he knows how to control mm -hmm. the TV screen, but his audience will be naturally shrinking and Navalny's audience will be naturally growing. Uh, that's just inevitable. So yes, uh, people know what's happening. Uh, the question is what they do, do they want to do anything about it? And uh, they probably would, but you know, admitting, admitting that the situation is, is such that a person uh, like Navalny can be, so he, they tried to kill him once, he miraculously survived. Now they're trying to kill him slowly uh, when he's in prison. Uh, so this is not a situation that you're comfortable with if you admit that mm. you're in a country where this is possible. So I myself discovered, I, I already mentioned that uh, some, in, in countries like Russia, sometimes you need a psychiatrist and not a political analyst to understand what's happening and what's going to happen. And I noticed that uh, understanding politics is, uh, for understanding politics, it's always, it, often helps to know some basic psychology. So mm. I would say that uh, I would call it, I don't know, the Stockholm syndrome maybe what's happening with the, with the Russian uh, population mm. that it's, uh, it's hard Falling to- in love with their it's captor. Hard, it's hard to admit that you are under, you have no power over your, over your, that you're- and then, um, yeah. and there Alexei Navalny comes in, uh, yes, and, a, journal, and a, a journalist turned, turned politician um, and uh, and has a big, a relatively quick gained uh, a lot of momentum in Russia what is um, what what is the general public's view of Alexei Navalny? I mean is there is there a massive support for his demands um, or is that something that we in the West and uh, and people in our uh, interest sphere would wish there was? That's, that's a very complicated issue because as you can imagine, he's been vilified like no, uh, no, no other person by the Russian propaganda. So uh, of course he's been uh, depicted as uh, the one who wants to destabilize Russia to sell it to the, uh, to the West, to his uh, Western masters and whatnot. So, but as I said, mm -hmm his uh, channel is very popular, his investigations are very popular. So he is using, he knows the language of the social media, so he could pack this uh, information that many of the things that he put in, into his, his investigations have been discovered by, uh, by some other journalists or had mm -hmm. been public uh, for quite a while, but he knows how to make it entertaining, how to combine this investigate investigative uh, uh, investigation and entertainment. So he knows mm. how to reach the audience. And a lot of people are saying that, I think the most common um, sentiment towards him is, yeah, I don't like him as a person. And then you can see a whole, like, and there, <laughs> there's a list of possible uh, explanations yeah. why. Like he's too radical, he doesn't have a program, he used to be a nationalist. Uh, mm. He never been in power, blah, blah, blah. I, I just don't like, I don't know. I don't like his ears. I don't like his nose, whatever. whatever. But, but, and people go, what they are, what the government is doing with him is totally, uh, mm. is totally wrong. It's horrific and uh, it's horrible. And uh, this is, a lot of people are saying this. And, mm. and the thing is, uh, now that again what's happening with him i don't know if if our audience is aware but uh he's been he's been on a hunger strike uh for almost three for three weeks already 
mm. his uh, health is uh, in serious in serious danger, and uh, the Kremlin uh, the Kremlin sources like the Russia Today and uh, the uh, the pro Kremlin bloggers uh, now they are saying like their narrative is as follows like why does he demand a special treatment who is who is he he's in prison he's not in a mm. sanatorium but in fact he doesn't demand a special treatment he uh, he just demands a normal treatment and things that are happening to him uh, it's it's heartbreaking to admit but this is that's just the way the system acts towards basically any it, it can happen to any any person who ends up in prison uh mm. anyone who did a crime and didn't haven't committed a crime yes. and he just he's just in the spotlight so he attracts yeah okay no good thank you um i want to uh, leave the floor now to my colleague Negin, uh, who i know has been collecting Loads of questions from the audience. In the meantime, I have I've seen lots of questions come in while we were talking, Vera. I have a gazillion other questions for you, but I think we should uh, we should also let other people ask questions. Therefore, I'm happy to hand over to you now, Negin. Thank you very much, and thank you, Vera, for a very exciting uh, storytelling about the situation. So I have picked some questions. Um, I'm going to start with a question from Sern who writes, um, thank you very much for your perspectives and for standing up here at this event. As a Danish citizen, it sometimes feels difficult to speak up to the international community about all the problems in Russia, including the Navalny case. Seen from your perspective, what can be done better? This, what can be done better to the situation and what kind of wishes do you have from Scandinavian and European countries? Oh, that's a very, thank you very much. It's a very tough question. And uh, I always feel sad when I'm asked it because I, underst because I understand that as much as I would like to say that, uh, um, so basically there is, yes, the situation in Russia, the, it depends on the, the, the main factor that will be uh, a decisive factor will be the, the people in Russia. So uh, there is, no magic wand that belongs to the people in the West, uh, in Scandinavia or in Washington or in Brussels uh, that can, can uh, change the situation, that can tip the scale. So what's important is, I think, the global solidarity, spreading the word. So uh, the events like this are very important uh, and there should be more of them. There should be, I think, more voices. I, I would like I think that uh, people should be given a voice, those who are currently, so I'm, I've been in Russian politics for, for years, uh, but I'm out of Russia right now, but there are a lot of people who are currently there. If I open my uh, Twitter feed, uh, like every, every, single every single entry would be, uh, I'm arrested, or I had a visit from policemen to today, uh, this morning, or I received a call from the police saying that I'm under investigation because today there is a, this uh, nationwide uh, rally uh, in support of Navalny plant. And right now, as we are talking here, uh, my friends and former colleagues are being, uh, uh, well, they are standing against the system. So I think that uh, this, is, this is important to give a voice to people who are inside of it. And also, uh, I think it's very important to distinguish uh, the Putin Kremlin and Putin, Putin's policy, Putin's propaganda from Russia as a country, because it's always heartbreaking to see uh, people saying like, Russia wants war or Russia wants to, uh, Russia hates the Western values, or Russia uh, wants to kill Navalny, or Russia despises, uh, does re disrespects human rights. It's it's Putin who does it all, and uh, Russia is is a big country, and a lot of people have no voice there. But doesn't mean that they support uh, what's happening. 
and again in, a, in an authoritarian country you never know what the real what people's real opinion opinions are uh, because they they cannot be honest with the uh, uh, pollsters they cannot be honest uh, on their social media and uh, the Soviet Union broke up a few months after a referendum in which 97 or 98 percent of the citizens supported the uh, keeping the country it means that there is there are always undercurrents, underground. Uh, the, the underground descent can be building up for for a while before you discover it's there. Before there is a critical mass. So uh, I. So yes, uh, that's that's probably what what can be done, uh, given more voices and always and always stressing the fact that Russia and Putin are two different things. Thank you. We have another question from Lon Anderson, who writes, being a political person and in opposition to the Putin regime, are you afraid of your life? And do you have any special to protect yourself in your daily life? I live outside of Russia. So a short question would be, uh, no, I'm, I'm not afraid for my life. I knew if I came back to Russia to live there, uh, I'd have serious problems probably finding a job, especially a job of, especially doing everything that I've been doing all my life, writing uh, about poli like an analyzing political affairs, uh, writing about politics. So it's, there are very few people who, who are like Navalny, who, who have reasons to be afraid of, of for, for their life. Uh, but it's just that, if you're a regular activist they will try to do their all they can to make your life very difficult so there are all sort of uh also there are many ways so people who are uh particip who are retweeting navalny's uh, calls to to go to the streets people who are spreading his investigations people who are criticizing the government on the social media they can if they are students they can get expelled if they are uh, adults they can lose their job or and this is what happens to what is happening on a daily basis with a lot of my friends so it's not a life-threatening situation but it's a very uh life um hardening situation if i may say so okay we have another quick question from Jakvan who writes, what is your opinion on the Western sanctions on Russia and how do you see the future for sanctions on Russia? That's a tough question. That's a good question and a very tough one. Uh, they, as I said, in 2014, uh, the sanctions were very uh, important in, um, uh, was a very important factor in uh, uh, bringing down the the Russians uh, national the Russian national currency ruble, which fell twice, uh, it was both a result of the sanctions and the falling oil price, and also in the international isolations. But uh, as we see, it was a, they weren't effective in uh, changing Putin's and the Kremlin's uh, neither foreign nor domestic policies. So we shouldn't have uh, we shouldn't overestimate uh, the power of sanctions. And so from a moral, on the one hand, I don't, have a, I don't have a straightforward answer. There are two sides of this coin. So to this point, so on the one hand, uh, from the moral perspective, it's important to show to, to the Russian government that uh, they are not welcome in the global community anymore. Uh, but on the, in a practical sense, well, we can look at Iran it's been under sanctions for ages and it hasn't, and the regime is still there. Uh, so it doesn't, and, to, and on top of all of this, it gives uh, Putin the high moral ground to say, you see everyone's against us. Uh, they want to sanction us because they are afraid that we will be, they want to weaken us. So of the Russian propaganda, the, the television, uh, is uh, trying to reframe this uh, idea of sanctions as if it, they, those are sanctions against the Russian people, not against the Russian government. So there are targeted sanctions against specific people, which I think uh, can work. 
uh, not in a way that they will openly uh, distance themselves from Putin, because as I explained earlier, it's it's not something that Putin will tolerate uh, today uh, on behalf of his friends and uh, cronies. But uh, in the long run, probably that that could work because many of them, as you know, have uh, many of his close uh, friends and cronies have their families abroad, uh, have their kids, uh, children and families living somewhere in Miami and London, here in London or in Switzerland. But again, this is this is also changing. And uh, so again, the sanctions will not be the changing factor. They will not be the decisive factor in Russian politics. The decisive factor will be the Russians themselves. We have uh, another question from Mehmet, who asks, uh, what is the most important main points from Putin's talk today? And do you expect Russia will evolve into a total war with Ukraine? Uh, surprisingly, speaking of Putin's, uh, you, you mean, is it uh, about Putin's address to the parliament? Yes. Yes. So surprisingly, there were no, uh, uh, there were no message that was really, uh, so it was very, there was nothing special in this as far as, I haven't watched it. I'm, <laughs> when I was a journalist, I had to, I always had to watch all his public talks and it wasn't the, the best uh, experience, but now I, I've read the, the main points and apparently there were nothing unexpected. Of course, there have been rumors like maybe he will declare a war, maybe he will say something about Ukraine, but he didn't say anything about Ukraine or about Navalny, the, the two topics that have been on the surface recently. So it was very predictable. He was speaking about supporting the family, financial support for families, uh, the recovery from the COVID and all these things. So I wouldn't single out anything specifically. And as for the war, as for the war with Ukraine, I hope it won't happen because as I said in 2014, it helped him to, um, to gain popularity. It helped him to uh, boost his uh, support, but it was quite a short-lived uh, support because people very soon started feeling the economic uh, the economic um, stagnation uh, in their daily lives, the result, the effects of the effect of the stagnation. So I don't think he will try to do it again. He might uh, try to. Uh, he might want everyone, include both within Russia and outside, to uh, to think that he's serious this time. But uh, Ukra even Ukraine is much more prepared now in terms of in, in military terms and in terms of international alliances and in terms of energy independence ukraine is uh, much less dependent on russia now it's much uh, stronger uh, in terms of being more prepared for a conflict so i i hope there won't be any open conflict uh, and because putin should understand this thank you <coughs> sorry we have another question from Sylvian, who asks, the, who writes, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and personal experience. My question is the following. What would be the future of Russia right after Putin? And when can we expect, um, and when can we expect that political change will come in, uh, in Russia? <laughs> there's, a, there's a good saying about this, like how long do we have to wait for changes? If you, if you will be waiting, it will be long. Uh, so it's, uh, so we don't, we don't know what's going to be after Putin because Putin has created a system which uh, is all, where everything is depends on one person uh, and one person's uh, decisions. So he doesn't have any successor. They've been uh, for the first 10 to 12 years of his uh, Putin's power, there have been constant talks, who is his successor? Who, who, who is going to, who is Putin going to leave uh, as a successor when he, 
when he retires. Now it's clear that he's not going to retire. He's going to stay for as long as he as he is able to. So uh, and at the same time, there is no there is no uh, alternative. Uh, well, the what we call the uh, system, system, systemic uh, system opposition, as it's called, it's, it's also destroyed. So uh, what's happening after he leaves, uh, it's a matter, well, how should I say this? Um, again, I, I like to compare this with Ukraine because as I, as Lucas mentioned, I live, I live there. I moved to Ukraine after, after the Ukrainian revolution, uh, partially because I wanted to see what happens in a country when there is a sudden unexpected uh, democratic uh, revolution and the country gets a chance to, uh, to reform itself and uh, how you can do this. And what I realized is that uh, you need to have a plan before it happens. You never know, it's kind of a black swan event, uh, if you know this term, like something that nobody can predict. Uh, things like uh, the democratic revolutions, uh, are they happen, they are unpredicted and unpredictable. And... Um, we have so many questions, sorry. Oh, can yes. I just move on so some of them can get an answer? I'm so sorry, it's so ex really interesting to yeah, hear. Yeah, so my, let me finish this, let me finish the thought. Uh, so the thing is, you don't know where, where it, when it happens, but the key is to having a roadmap for reforms, for reforming the system before it happens. And this is one of the things uh, that also Navalny's team is doing and not just him. So, uh, for example, I'm uh, affiliated with a libertarian think tank in Russia, and we helped. We were approached by Navalny's team last year, asking to draft uh, an economic reform for the future Russia. Uh, so we don't know if Navalny is going to be a president or if me and my colleagues are going to be in the parliament. But it, it's good to it's good to have a plan. It's good to have a uh, to to have. Uh, it's good to know what you what you're going to do because a lot of people are saying yes you're against Putin but what are you for so yes there should be a roadmap and uh, we are preparing one thank you um Nikolai Lono asks what initiatives if any from the European Union would be considered most helpful helpful by members of uh, Russia's democratic uh, opposition broadly speaking <laughs> Again, that that brings me back to to my point that as much as we want to, as much as the West, uh, the friends of of the Russian civil society in the West want to help, it's it's not going to be this 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 is a decisive factor. So one thing, what what shouldn't be done is uh, the sanctions, uh, not just economic, but sanctions against Russia as a as a whole Russia as a country so bans on entering on making on doing business uh, for anyone possessing a Russian passport uh, that was uh, for example a few I think two days ago uh, the former president of Estonia tweeted uh, uh, in on his Twitter proposed that uh, all Russians should be banned uh, from entering the European Union uh, because there's a war and I think nothing can be more counterproductive than uh, propos proposals like this, because uh, it will only help Putin to to self isolate to isolate Russia from from the West. If uh, if you see Russia and Russians as uh, as your enemies, not as hostages uh, in the hands of a uh, dictatorial regime that won't help. That will only help Putin to say, "You see, they they really hate you. They 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 are not your friends." Mm, so, uh, as much as Russians can travel freely, can uh, you know do some exchange exchange study programs, uh, trade and do business with the, with the West. Uh, as much as uh, as, as long as they can do all of this, they can communicate uh, on a personal level with the people in the West, people from democratic, uh, de liberal democratic countries. Uh, they are, no, they won't be uh, 
so susceptible to to Putin's propaganda, they will see that uh, that's I know that's that's how the civilized uh, world lives, and that's uh, the way that hopefully well, one day Russia will uh, will live. Thank you very much. We don't have enough time to finish the last five questions left. I'm so sorry uh, to the to the people who are watching. Um, I have one question. We have five minutes left, so I hope you can answer that really shortly. Who is managing Navalny's Instagram account? I don't know. Okay. I think it's it's pro it's either his wife or his press secretary, or I think maybe. I guess. Well, there are definitely several people who have access to it because uh, any of them can be arrested. So his press secretary uh, was arrested this morning, for example, uh, Kirill Yarmush. Uh, so if I were Navalny, I would definitely uh, not put all the eggs in the same basket. Because if you are affiliated with Navalny, you're always uh, on the radar. Thank you very much, Vera, for your time today and for all these interesting informations and opinions and answer, answering um, people who joined us today. Uh, and once again, um, thank you for joining us and you can go online and read more about us, um, the, the Foreign uh, Pol Policy Society, uh, if you wanna know more and to attend more events. We will hope, we hope to see you more and Yes, we're gonna finish this now. So have a nice evening. Thank you. Bye guys. Bye. Bye.